Hello, this is Neil Buchanan with Rock Our World. I'm going to go over three things as quickly as I can. Uh, the first is a correction, so to speak, and the other two are additions. And those are the things that happen in the restoration of all things. The Lord uh, keeps teaching us all. And uh, my objective is to keep everybody as up to date as I can. So this uh, first one, a, a correction, so to speak, of uh, something I said, uh, I reviewed Psalm 119, uh, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. And I discussed the, the word that was translated word, and I said it was Torah. And uh, I was wrong. It uh, is... Actually, the word word is translated uh, in Psalm 119 in, as two words. Uh, there's 1697 in Strong's and 565, and each are used 19 times, each of these two words that are translated word, and Torah is used 25 times. And... Uh, I'll just report the uh, Strong's Concordance says that the one word, 1697, means matter, thing, cause, word, commandment. And the word 565 means commandment, speech, word. So very similar. Whereas Torah means precept, statute, and especially the Ten Commandments. And I've added that it's uh, in particular uh, not just ten, that's kind of like the starter kit. But the 600 plus commandments or points of instruction that are found in the Torah. And then uh, in a greater general sense, the Torah refers to the first five books of the Bible. Anyway, that's a lot of intellectual information. Uh, believers, by and large, love this verse. It's very short, simple, and straightforward. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. And I'd seen it in a hospital this summer in a picture frame in a few different places. And uh, so the, I'm just going to give you my, my uh, ideas on the meaning of the word word and as opposed to Torah. Uh, I think most people would agree the word means everything that God has spoken. So we could say the first focus would be everything written in what we call our Bible. And whereas the Torah is more specific that it's the first five books that God has written in what we call our Torah. And uh, the Jewish people call it the Torah, those first five books. And then the grouping of the prophets are called the prophets. And then the leftovers, which the psalm comes from, uh, from the writings, which David wrote. So, uh, word and Torah have the same meaning in that God wrote it. and But it's more specific, and it's, it's just uh, these first uh, five books, and specifically the 600 plus commandments, points of instruction that he's given us, teachings and instructions. So, um, what I would encourage the listeners to do is make a study and find all 38 places, 19 and 19, that word is used, and all 25 times that Torah is used, and you will uh, be hard-pressed to convince anyone that that the Torah is done away with, but the Word is not done away with. Okay, I'll leave that one alone. The next thing I want to cover is uh, uh, the subject of depression I had touched on in a uh, former episode. And I want to add uh, that Sid Roth is a very valuable resource. Uh, so I encourage everybody, all the listeners, to look up Sid Roth. It's very easy to find. If I can do it, anybody can. 
and look in his archives, get your uh, whatever it takes to get your computer hooked up to SidRoth.org and go into his archives and find Dennis and Jen Clark on the subject of self-deliverance. It was aired first on December 18th, 2016. Very recent. And uh, Dennis and Jen talk uh, about how the idea of inviting Jesus into our hearts is different from in intellectualizing it. Uh, and I would encourage anyone who has doubts that they have Jesus in their heart uh, that they would watch this and I want to also encourage them that they don't need to have doubts that if they've invited Jesus into their heart he's there but we do have a problem as humans to in intellectualize things and as Dennis explained and his wife Jen that we invite our Lord into the lower regions of our body and then our heart will inform our mind that we don't uh, we we try as humans to invite Jesus into our head and uh, it doesn't work that way anyway those are kind of spiritual descriptions of a or a physical descriptions of a spiritual um, process or experience. Anyway, uh, hopefully that's helpful in this ongoing battle against depression. Satan is going to use depression more and more as the last days unfold and we need to be equipped to deal with it and to be delivered from it. We do have authority over all the power of the enemy but we do need to learn how to use that authority. We need to be taught how. And uh, these, uh, uh, this couple, uh, Dennis and Jen Clark, are very helpful. And also, I previously mentioned uh, the Jewish G Jesus that he had a guest on there. So go back in my episodes and look that up. Now, the third thing I want to go over and tackle is uh, talking about the festivals. You know what? I missed something here. I'm going to read something. Go back to Psalm 119 uh, and and uh, verse 105. I found this I'd written some years ago and I'm just going to read it. Uh, and this is talking about um, learning things from the scriptures, i.e. the word of God or the, and including the Torah. <clears throat> I just came up with an idea. The idea that speaking in tongues is only beneficial to the self unless there is an interpreter there to translate. The whole issue of tongues remains clouded. It appears it is a very real language, but it is seldom understood. So this is my idea. When we first read the Torah, Prophets, and Writings, they are largely unintelligible. Uh, Yeshua, or Jesus, when he was here, said that when he left us, he would send us the Holy Spirit who would teach us all things and give us power. This is a perfect analogy of the scriptures and speaking in tongues. The scriptures cannot be understood until the Holy Spirit reveals the meaning of them to us. The biggest mistake believers make is that they never or seldom read the Torah, Prophets, and Writings. So how can the Holy Spirit reveal the meaning if we never download the information? We have to read it, that is speaking in tongues, before the Holy Spirit can teach the meaning, interpreting the tongues. This then is the correct and ultimate meaning of the application of tongues and interpretation. All else is allegorically a prelude to this final and full truth. In Matthew 22:29, you err not knowing the scriptures. Acts 17:11, follow the examples of the Bereans who searched the scriptures daily 
And I'll just interject that the scriptures then and now and always will be the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. I have referred to this in the past and uh, more out from my wife that what we call the New Testament is the inspired commentary. Whenever you you hear or read about the scriptures being referred to in the New Testament, what Christians call the New Testament, they are always talking about the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. They are not talking about what we call the New Testament. So, go back and say this again. Follow the example of the Bereans who search the scriptures, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings daily to see if these things were so. And again, in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is useful in correction, in establishing doctrine, and uh, building up the man or woman of God. It's all breathed by God. All three of these examples are referring only to the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Following the admonition of the Lord, we will err if we do not know the scriptures the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. For the sake of this argument, let's call um, our New Testament the inspired post-advent writings or post-advent commentary, or the inspired commentary, as I've mentioned. We will most definitely err if we read only the commentary, which is information concerning something. In this case, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Logically, we must read the subject first before the commentary about it, or the it, will remain a mystery. That is the state of the belie believing church, or this is, the state of the believing church. Very few have studied the scriptures, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, written in tongues so that the Holy Spirit, our teacher, can then interpret the tongues, that is, reveal the meaning to us. Let's be like the Bereans who studied the Torah, the prophets, and the writings daily, and not be a workman ashamed, correctly handling the Word of God. That's 2 Timothy 2.15. As an added note, the Torah, prophets, and writings most likely include the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, and the Book of Jubilees, and there are likely others. This is certainly, there is certainly nothing in these three or more that can lead one astray, but will only add more details to what is already in the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And the book of Enoch will give, gives the only known basic information on the subject of how God's calendar works and where demons came from. Now, we'll go back to the festivals. I want to do a quick review of the, of the festivals and with some added information. The spring festivals are the Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, and the uh, Feast of Fruits Fruits. The Passover was fulfilled uh, when Jesus died. He was and is the Lamb of God. He died exactly on the Passover when the Lamb was slain up until that point uh, as per the instructions of our Lord. He uh, was crucified on the cross. His blood was spilled and then he was put in the grave for three days and three nights. Those three days and three nights were during the days of unleavened bread. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, and 8, and Galatians 5, 9, and a number of places also in the, in the four Gospels, we get a basic understanding explained by the, uh, the apostles of how leaven represents sin and that we are to remove sin from our lives. Now, Jesus, when he died and rose and spilled his blood, he removed sin from our lives. He gave us uh, the means by which our sins can be forgiven so all sin is removed from us. 
And so the the picture and analogy of removing sin from our homes is the same as removing sin from our lives. And uh, we could go a little bit further in this analogy that uh, Jesus spent half, almost half of those seven days of olive bread in the grave and came back out and fulfilled uh, removing sin from our lives and then the, the other four days is our journey through life and getting uh, using God's help, his, uh, his Holy Spirit, his uh, listening to him and following his lead in our lives to remove sin from our lives in the future. So all past is, sin is forgiven and all future mistakes are dealt with and our journey through life is to 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 become perfect like uh, like our Lord is and to remove all sin from our lives. So anyway, there's a very uh, clear analogy there in the days of unleavened bread. And then the Feast of First Fruits, Jesus rose on the Feast of First Fruits. And that is described in the scriptures as the first Sabbath. Uh, after the harvest begins and Jesus was the first of the first fruits he rose on a Sabbath right in the day, middle of the days of love and bread and obviously the harvest uh, the, of barley had begun in uh, Israel on that particular uh, year that Jesus did all these things these three things that he did in his first coming and that, that's an addition. When I went through in an earlier episode of how you find the Feast of First Fruits and then begin the count of five of seven weeks to the day of or of the Feast of Weeks, which is been misnamed Pentecost, then I missed that part. That it, that was a possibility that the fe the harvest can begin during the days of unleavened bread, not not. Uh, after they're over. Uh, that was obvious because Jesus fulfilled this. He's the first of the first fruits and then 50 days, uh, uh, sorry, not 50 days, but seven weeks, and I explained this in an earlier episode, the count of seven weeks later, uh, the the believers gathered on the, the Feast of First Fruits, or the Feast of Weeks, and they were uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, in fact 3,000 new believers were added to the body of Christ and that was the the first uh, radical uh, move of the Holy Spirit and there were many since we've uh, recognized a few in recent history the Azusa Street uh, the the blessing in Toronto, the Vineyard Church in Toronto, and then it went down into uh, to Pensacola and Brownsville, I think it was. Anyway, uh, as time progresses, we'll see more and more of these phenomena. We'll see great outpourings of the Holy Spirit and amazing miracles happening. And it all began with the first of the first fruits. That was Jesus Christ. And then uh, seven weeks later, a great outpouring at that first Feast of Weeks after Yeshua died. And then as the years have caught, uh, gone by, we've seen more and more of these things happening. And we'll see greater things in the future. An increase, a constant increase of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So that covers the three in the spring that Jesus already fulfilled and then the one in the summer that he has fulfilled also and is continuing to fulfill and then that leaves the last three festivals of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, in his sec that will be fulfilled at his second coming and that is the on the first day of the seventh month the Feast of Trumpets on which he will return in power and glory and uh, subdue the nations and take over all authority on earth and begin his rule of a thousand years with the bride of Christ, with the saints. 
And then 10 days later, on the Day of Atonement, the only fast day amongst the, the festivals of our Lord, uh, pictures the judgment of the nations and possibly uh, further judgment of, of uh, the people. They'll receive judgments. A very solemn time where we reap the reward of all that we've invested. So we've got to make sure that we're investing in the kingdom and not in earthly things. And then uh, lastly, the last festival is the Feast of Trumpet, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booze. It can be translated the Feast of Temporary Dwellings. An eight-day feast, which is the most joyous festival. And it pictures the the harvest, the great harvest of souls at the end of the age. So that covers them all and I would like to point uh, people to again to Sid Roth. He had a guest on very recently. Uh, you'll find him. He was within the last year. I should have looked up his name but you'll find him. He's a so Southern Baptist that the Lord uh, took and downloaded the entirety of what we call the Old Testament, the Torah, the Prophets, and the Writings. He was a typical Christian who went to church, didn't read the scriptures very much, didn't know too much about the Bible, what we call the Bible, and only uh, believed what he was taught at church. And uh, God took that man and did an amazing miracle downloaded the entirety of the Torah, the Prophets, and the Writings into him and told him that the important, most important place to start is the book of Leviticus and that the seven yearly festivals are very, very important. Those are the appointed times of the Lord. So I think I have a wrap on everything I want to uh, correct and add. And I will sign off. Neil Buchanan with Rock Our World.